you do not get stronger by lifting more weight. You lift more weight because you got stronger. Mm -hmm. The dose you were using before successfully yes. made you stronger. Which when you say that and someone just hears it, they're like, whatever, like it's the same thing. No, no. Like repeat that. Again. Like that is very, 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 very important. You don't force adaptation. Adaptation occurs because the body adapts to the stimulus. And the thing to not miss in there too, is that it is possible that the same stimulus you were using before could still generate adaptation even exactly. now. Exactly. So you don't necessarily have to change it if it is still working. Hey guys, welcome back to another week with Drew and Alex on the Mops and Most Fireside Chats. And more specifically, this is a continuation of our 101 series. This would be the second one. Second one. Second one. So the first 101 series that we did, 101 series episode that we did was the recovery episode. Today, uh, you will have the pleasure of listening to Alex and I talk about the differences between rate of perceived exertion and percentages as ways of prescribing, I suppose, prescribing resistance training. We'll probably have some conversation in here too about endurance training, um, but... For those that are unfamiliar, the whole idea behind the 101 series is to, I guess, in a, in a way, return to our roots with some intentionality, uh, have some discussions about some of the basics on programming, training, whatever you want to throw into that bucket. This is not to take away from any of the conversations that we have with some of our esteemed guests, but we do recognize that there is a certain chunk of the population out there listening to this that is very interested in our thoughts behind programming. Did I miss anything? Yeah. And it's also, I think the 101 series also serves a secondary purpose to a little degree of explaining why the training we do on long and strong is designed the yes. way it is. Yes. And so that'll, that'll, we'll draw that out here. If people who train on that program will definitely know that it includes RPE in there. Mm -hmm. um, and this will hopefully help explain a little bit of why. Yeah. So RPE versus percentages, again, mostly through the lens of resistance training, just because I think that that's where you see this most often, but certainly a, um, a nod to the endurance space, because I don't know if we want to start with kind of the history of rate of perceived exertion. You're a history nerd. Might be good to start with the history. I'm a history nerd. Out. That's fair. Um, so we'll talk about RPE, rate of perceived exertion, uh, and you will... Uh, Throughout this episode, hear us sort of interchangeably use RPE and RIR, which is reps in reserve, which we'll get into here in a little bit, kind of defining that. But rate of perceived exertion is exactly what it sounds like. It is a way of quantifying your individual perceived level of effort, I think would probably be the simplest way to put it. So from a historical perspective, depending on which avenue you go down, if you Google RPE, there's a couple of different um, formats you'll see. The one that we'll talk about here just briefly comes from the Borg scale, B-O-R-G. I believe he was Swedish, uh, coming from the track and field space? I assume so. Maybe? Well, probably distance because heart rate stops being particularly effective at shorter distances, and Borg is all about heart rate. For sure, for sure. So the, the Borg scale of rate of perceived exertion is the one that you will have seen going from six to 20, which seems really arbitrary at first. But once you realize that what he was trying to do was correlate those to heart rates, it makes a little bit more sense. So uh, an RPE of six would roughly correspond to a level of effort that puts your heart rate at 60 beats per minute, which obviously is not very much. It's the lowest RPE on the scale. So that would just kind of be sitting uh, and then 200, or I guess 20, would correlate with 200 beats per minute, which is very high. So you can kind of see along that spectrum from 6 to 20, as arbitrary as it seems at first. What we're looking at here is a correlation to heart rate. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts or anything to add on Borg. I'll just add, I did a quick Google because of our lack of certainty on the origins of the <laughs> Borg scale. Um, he was actually a professor at Stockholm University. And he developed it mostly looking at uh, like health outcomes kind of stuff. 
Mm. Um, to quote him, he recognized that humans were built for physical work, but either too much or too little exercise could be detrimental. So he was kind of coming at this one from a an exercise science standpoint and looking at ways to quantify intensity. Right. And so that, as as best to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, but that was sort of the original or the first RPE scale, the six to 20. Um, and it's it's clumsy. Like that's a weird way to categorize things. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense once you take a step away from what they were doing with heart rate. So yeah, it works super nicely if all you care about is heart rate. Is heart rate. And so you just multiply by 10, you're good to go easy. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start doing anything where heart rate isn't a good indicator, like shorter distance, higher intensity stuff or resistance training kind of goes out the window. Right. Or you're watching a scary movie or you, somebody like sneaks into your house. I don't know. Your heart rate spikes. Your level of effort hasn't really gone anywhere. So some flaws, which is why I think more often than not, what you will find when you look up rate of perceived exertion or what you'll see on the wall at your YMCA is the one to 10 scale. One being sort of sitting there doing nothing and then 10 being all out effort. So fast forward a little bit and we get into the introduction of RPE to the resistance training space. And we've talked about this before. We, we did a podcast kind of touching on auto-regulation using rate of perceived exertion in the past and full credit to Mike Tashir on this one. Mike Tashir, for folks that are unfamiliar, is a powerlifting coach. Uh, he went to the Air Force Academy. I didn't know you didn't know that. Yeah. So in, in prepping for this episode, I, I knew about his role in bringing RPE to the weightlifting space. I knew about his, or sorry, powerlifting space. And I knew about How his accomplishments as a power lifter. Dude is strong as heck. Strong dude. Strong dude. Um, well, but I did not know about his military connection. Um, mm -hmm. He went to the Air Force Academy. He coached the Air Force Academy powerlifting team. While he um, was on the team. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, he just happened to be like the strongest guy on the team. So we started doing some coaching yeah. stuff. Um, and then I like, went off to like break a bunch of powerlifting records as an Air Force missile officer, which if anybody here knows Air Force missile officers, nothing against them, but they are not known for being jacked. They sit in uh, silos all day, don't they? Yeah. Was he that uh, kind of missile officer? Yeah, I mean, that is my understanding of it. And he his first assignment, I can't remember where it was, but it was like middle of nowhere. Um as most, as most missile assignments are. <laughs> um, but like while well, he was still like in tech school for being a missile or whatever, so like right after the Air Force Academy, um, he weighed in at two hundred and sixty six pounds with a powerlifting total of two thousand three hundred and forty two pounds. Uh, which is pretty strong. Yeah. That's squat plus bench plus deadlift for people who don't know. Right, like everybody who's trying to join the thousand pound club, he was pretty far north of the he 2, was pound club. almost two and a half times above what you're trying to hit. Yeah. I was just gonna say he was a he was a big old nerd as well as a lifter. And he talked about this a lot. He was like reading tons and tons of books and like bumping mm -hmm. into new things and uh decided to bring auto regulation over to the strength training space. And I don't I mean I've listened to Mike's stuff for years and I've read his stuff. He has he's got a great little book. Um that someone has stolen from me, so I don't have it anymore. But I won't. I won't try to steal the words from his mouth. I would direct folks to some of the things he said in the past. I I can't remember exactly what the sort of trigger was for him to do this, but nonetheless, he did it. Brought rate of perceived exertion to powerlifting, and I guess the rest is kind of history. So much so that actually, I I do remember trying to figure out how to best auto regulate endurance training and i couldn't really find anything it seems that all the stuff on auto regulation now has to do with weightlifting and by the way i keep saying the word auto regulation and i realize as i've said that we haven't even really talked about it and i'll just really briefly explain what that means because i think it's important for the context of this podcast auto regulation is effectively just allowing for individual fluctuations in training uh specifically kind of subjective regulate or subjective fluctuations sort of based on how you're feeling, how prepared you are, various other factors. It's a, it's a way of encapsulating the human element and introducing that into training, which as we'll get into here in a bit runs completely opposite to what percentages tend to do when it comes to programming for training. So when I say auto, auto regulation, what I'm talking about is kind of the subjective foundation that RPE is used to try and put some numbers behind. Did that? I don't even know if that made sense. Does that make I sense? think it makes sense. If you want, I can do the like quick research tangent Please. right now to explain why that's important. Please. Um, so, and if I had to guess 
what motivated Mike to bring auto regulation into the coaching he was doing. It's probably that the unique environment of a military academy means people may arrive at practice for powerlifting, training for powerlifting with various outside stressors affecting their performance on that day that might be pretty extreme. Uh, there might be a lot of sleep deprivation. There might be other demands, physical or cognitive, all sorts of other things. Um, that's certainly not unique to a military academy, but it might be slightly exacerbated in that environment. And he was probably recognizing that on any given day, people might perform differently. Um, so I'll, I'll just hit a couple research items that are relevant for setting the stage for this. And I'll throw the, the links to these in the show notes. Um, but the first one is the importance of understanding test retest reliability of one rep maxes. Like how, how likely if someone sets their one rep max, if we just like test them the next day, would it, would their one rep max be the same? Um, if you read the literature, you will find that it has excellent reliability as defined by coefficient of variation or intra-class correlation. There's a couple of different statistical methods they like to analyze these things with. Um, and it is true that as test retest validity things go, it's pretty reliable. But what does pretty reliable mean in practice? Um, you're, I, I broke it down. I'll pull out the study. You guys can go dig into it if you want to. But assuming your one rep max is in the neighborhood of a couple hundred pounds on something, even in controlled lab conditions where there aren't egregious things affecting your stress level outside of it, you should expect ten plus or minus 10 pounds of variation on any given day. And because of the way that the coefficient of variation works, where you're comparing how much variation there is to the mean, that means that the higher your one rep max is, the more variation you are likely to see. So if your max is like 400 pounds, you can expect plus or minus 20 pounds variation on any given day. Um, so that lays a little bit of foundation for why we might need a system that accounts better for fluctuations day to day than just a percentage of a one rep max that we know is not, not only is it not that reliable day to day, but if you've been training and you tested your one rep max a few weeks ago, your performance might've already changed anyway. Um, and the other one, I think we talked about this one before we did it a whole episode on the, uh, how much is too much study from the Olympic committee, but there's, there's this idea that objective things are more valid and accurate than subjective things. And that is simply not true when it comes to athletes' responses to training. Uh, the external load is the one that's easy to make objective. The number of pounds on the bar, the number of miles run, whatever. Those are external load. They don't change person to person. The internal load accounts for the individual differences in how they respond physiologically to the same external load. You could have two people lift 300 pounds and they would respond very differently. Or two people run a couple miles and they respond very differently. Internal load is generally measured subjectively. You have to ask them how it feels. This is where the auto-regulation stuff comes in. Um, but subjective measures reflect acute and chronic training loads with superior sensitivity and consistency than objective measures. So just tracking GPS or miles or pounds or whatever it is versus tracking subjectively with your athletes, tracking subjectively with your athletes is actually better at keeping track of how much strain they are under from the training um, bonus from the study is that subjective and objective measures of athlete well-being generally did not correlate. So when we try to do like objectively measurable things, HRV mileage, whatever versus subjectively measurable things, they don't tend to move in the same direction as much as one might hope. I know I've gotten a bunch of questions on the Instagram lately about like what data from your watch should you really care about? None of it. Uh, we will we will dive into that in a separate episode. I think we got to <laughs> we got to do another wearables episode soon. That's uh, true. But I would I would take some of the the strain and body battery kind of metrics with a little bit of a grain of salt. Body battery. Yes, Garmin, to, baby. Yeah. To your point, and again, we're we're sort of intentionally giving a lot of background here to set the stage for this conversation. But if you look at the history of strength and conditioning. Soviet texts, um, you know, Chinese, the, the different schools of thought typically around weightlifting or in some cases powerlifting, like there's a, nobody addresses the subjective piece of it. Like it's, it's very hard in the type of research that the strength and conditioning industry likes to do. It is very hard to account for subjectivity. 
because they're looking for sample sizes, they're looking for repeatability, they're looking for lab-based things. And so in my opinion, that is where this over-reliance on objective measures, i.e. percentages comes from um, and why it continues to be so popular. So it might, I mean, you tell me, it might make sense to just briefly give an overview of how like a percentage-based program might work to set the stage for that and get into some prolipins. So I was I was going to say you, you started mentioning Soviets, so it seems required at this point yeah. that we talk about prolipin start. Yeah, so I'll I'll let you do the prolipin thing, but just real quick, the for for folks that don't know or that don't really encounter this in their day to day, the the way that strength and conditioning, the way that most strength and conditioning coaches approach programming for strength, follows some version of this setup, which would be. In week one, we do a one rep max. So Alex comes into the gym, we load the barbell up and he squats the most weight he can for one rep. And let's say, what do you, what do you want your one rep to be? I don't want to like sell you short 400. 500, oh, oh, it's me. So easy, easy 500. Yeah. But yeah, 500 pounds, boom, 500 pounds. That's Alex's one rep max on the, on that Monday. So for me as a strength coach, I, I take that number and then I go away and I create, we'll call it four weeks of programming and each week this is the traditional linear periodization each week say we start at three sets of five at 80 percent of your one rep max and then the following week we do 82 and a half percent and the week after we do 85 percent and then we do 85 you know 87.5 so we just add we increase the percentage each week and then at the end of that microcycle mesocycle phase we retest your one rep max and that one rep max becomes the gold standard for whether or not the program worked. And that's, I mean, strength coaches are probably bashing their heads on their steering wheels right now because obviously there are more complex ways of doing that. There's a lot of nuance, but generally speaking, we test a one rep max, we get a number. That number serves as our baseline. We then increase intensity, i.e. we add more weight across a number of weeks while we decrease volume, i.e. we lift for fewer reps and then we retest and presumably that number is now higher. So now Alex is squatting 550 pounds and then we rinse and repeat over and over and over again. And it's, it's probably worth noting here that although we, like you'll probably get the vibe across the course of the conversation here that we fall on the side of RPE, especially in the kind of populations we work with, but that's not to say you can't find success on a percentage based program. Um, Drew knows this. I was a five, three, one fanatic for a long time. Um, one of the nice things about a percentage based program is that a coach can design a whole program in seconds if they know how to use Excel pretty decently, which is why um, I think it's so popular. I think that is why it's popular. I had my little Excel file for five, three, one. And mm -hmm. as, as long as I could get people with one rep maxes on a couple lifts, I could punch them in and it would do all the math and I would have three months of programming for them ready to go. Which uh, as you already discussed, and we'll probably get into more goes against what we know about human beings, which is that there is variation in daily readiness. So hit prolipin real quick and then we'll. Yeah. Um, you probably know more about like the, the history of prolipin. Um, I'll, I'll yes. give it my hack and I might. Can correct anything I get wrong. But, uh, so Alexander Sergeyevich prolipin, which if you was, didn't know is a Russian name. Yeah. Shocking. was a, <laughs> uh, a Russian coach, uh, a Soviet coach. Um, I believe in the seventies is when the chart was developed. Um, yes. and I, I did do a quick Google before this cause I wanted to confirm and get the numbers right. Um, despite the fact that the chart is like super widely applied by tons of people and like assumed to be true, it was actually just him looking at the training journals of some Olympic weightlifters from two different five week programs. Thousands um, that was of it. lifters though. He looked at thousands. True. Of, like, it was a lot, lot of lifters, but it was like basically just looking at what a bunch of people that were already following the same program did because they were following the same program. They were all part of the same training thing. Um, so it wasn't like testing whether it worked or not. It was purely retrospective. Um, it's also important to note that the chart is specifically and only looking at clean and jerk and snatch. Um, it is Olympic weightlifting that it was designed. Well, and it's, it's looking at their, it's based off of their contest maxes, which True. in and of itself is important because you got to think, I mean, We'll set the whole performance enhancing drug piece aside here because that 
<laughs> clearly plays a role, but you have someone who's peaking for a competition and a Olympic level competition. So we are pulling away just about every single stressor we can to arrive at a quote unquote one or max. And that's what these percentages and rep ranges and things are based off of. Mm -hmm. And then all it does from there is it, uh, it establishes like based on ranges of percentages of your one rep max, how many reps and sets you should be doing and the total number of reps you should be doing in a training session. So for example, and I'm looking at elite FTS's Prilipin's chart right now. And I mean, I say that because I've even seen some variation in what Prilipin's chart is. Yeah, I, I Googled it and you can find a bunch of different ones, but I think yeah. so the one like, they have is Hypothetically, if you are wanting to lift 80 to 90% of that one rep max, you would do two to four reps per set. Optimally, you would complete 15 total reps, but the range could be anywhere from 10 to 20. So if that doesn't make sense, if I wanted to lift, or if, let's say you with your 500 pound squat and me as your coach, if I wanted you to do, um, you know, today in the gym, we're going to do 85% of your one rep max. I would go to Prilipin's chart and I would see that we would want to be somewhere between two to four reps per Five set. Three, so baby. Let's call it three, right? You already beat me to it. Three. And the optimal number of reps, according to Prilipin, that we would want to complete for that session is 15. What's 15 divided by three? Five. Okay, cool. Five. That's how many sets we're doing. Five sets of three. And that falls within our total range of 10 to 20. So like, I cannot tell you guys how, how horny this chart makes strength coaches, like <laughs> strength coaches get so turned on by this chart because all of my work is done for me. And I literally cannot fail because if the program doesn't work, well, guess what? Lord Prilipin said this was optimal. So it's your fault that you're not, you know, progressing, adapting, whatever. As so long as you ignore the fact that like the number of reps you can do at a given percentage is definitely going to vary based on the exercise you are doing. It's um, going to vary case. based on the exercise. It's going to vary based on your mood. It's going to vary based on your like limb length. It's going to vary mm -hmm. based on whether or not an attractive person of the opposite or same sex walks in the gym. Like look up Hawthorne effect. If you want to have an idea of what I'm talking about, it's, I think Greg Glassman had the famous quote about rowing and like, if my cat walks in and sees me, I'm going to row faster. Like effectively what he's getting at there is like, there's so much subjectivity to this, which is why Prilipin's chart again, as like turned on as strength coaches get by patterns and numbers and percentages. It's like, guys, think about this for one second. So anyway, so I'm getting, getting heated. I mean, I think we did it. I don't think we're making a whole Prilipin start episode. I think we kind of, Check that box. Yeah. So we talked about a, a standard linear progression percentage-based program. We talked about Prilipin's chart, which is where a lot of that derives from. And then I, I say all of this with a huge caveat because clearly you could come on here and talk about undulating periodization and wave. And you talked about 531 and conjugate. Like there's a ton of different preordained templates that you could follow that would guide you through some fluctuation in percentages. And all and of there's that ways, is... there's ways to account for it, even if you're not using RPE, like there's ways to use a percentage based system and still account for variations in day to day performance, which we'll get to. Um, I think the five, three, one example is pretty simple, but like on any given five, three, one program, um, one, you're going to in intentionally underestimate your one rep max. You're going to like discount it to give yourself some room, which helps account for like competition day max and things like that. But, uh, there, there are also like programmed in sets where you just keep going to failure if you can do more than the prescribed number of reps you would expect at that given percentage and that accounts for improvement and things like that. So there's there's certainly ways to allow athlete variability within a percentage-based thing, but yes. anyway. Um, so all of that is to say that most of, I guess I would argue that most of what drives the preponderance of percentage-based programming and strength and conditioning is a fundamental misunderstanding of what progressive overload actually is. Ooh, uh, there we go. Is that a hot take? I guess it's, it is. I mean, it's one of your favorite takes, but I think it's important. <laughs> well, right. And we've, we've said this before and hopefully we keep saying it because I think this is one of the most critical pieces of understanding what I would call contemporary strength and conditioning. Progressive overload. So cover me on this if I screw it up, but effectively 
how progressive overload is normally taught to people is that you need to constantly increase the stressor to drive adaptation, which if you're hearing that sounds a lot like this idea of increasing the percentage every single week to account for some supposed adaptation on behalf of the athlete. And I'm not really sure why we as a community, we're just okay with that. Because if you look at like swimming or track, you don't just have someone swim faster every week or run faster every week. Like we know fundamentally that that doesn't work, but in strength and conditioning, Hey, let's add five pounds every week. Let's increase by two and a half percent, five percent in some cases. So there's this presumption that we are progressively overloading the athlete which is where my favorite stupid slide comes from in everyone's NSCA presentation, which is Milo and the bull. I saw it on a t-shirt last week. If you start your brief with a slide talking about Milo and the bull, you are everything you're saying after that is wrong. That's probably, well, you could, it. you could have a slide with Milo and the bull and manage to tell the story properly. It's just that they usually sure. tell the story <laughs> backwards, backwards where it is. It is somehow, the growth of the bull, which would be the weight Milo's on strength. The and yeah. you can, you can find this stuff all over the internet. I went and Googled this a couple months ago because we were having a conversation about this, but you can find a ton of articles on like magazine style fitness things talking about how to force muscle growth or how to force strength gains and like whatever thing it is, it, it perpetuates this idea that you have to like do something special in your program to force the adaptation to occur rather than like allow the adaptation to occur, which is more of what is happening, right? Like the, yes. if, if you are in this, I'm stealing your thing. Well, I'll say it like this. It, you, you do not get stronger by lifting more weight. You lift more weight because you got stronger. Mm -hmm. The dose you were using before successfully yes. made you stronger. Which when you say that and someone just hears it, they're like, whatever, like it's the same thing. No, no. Like repeat that. Again. Like that is very, 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 very important. You don't force adaptation. Adaptation occurs because the body adapts to the stimulus. And the thing to not miss in there too is that it is possible that the same stimulus you were using before could still generate adaptation it, even exactly. now. Exactly. So you don't necessarily have to change it if it is still working. So what ends up happening in the percentage-based approach? is that you have an athlete test their one rep max. And typically in a gym on one rep max day, the music's loud, everyone's pumped up. They've known that this day is coming. There's there's like a ton of hype around it. So they put in a supra maximal effort and they achieve some, you know, in Alex's case, he's squatting 500 pounds. So you've already set the stage for them to exceed what their kind of normal day-to-day -day, we'll call it a one rep max actually is. So we've we've set the bar there too high. We then look at, okay, let's zoom out. We're going to do a four to six week program and we're going to start you based on Prilipin's chart at 80%, 85%, whatever. So we're now lifting supra maximally. We're lifting at potentially a stimulus that is too low to cause any adaptation. And let's say we do that and the next week we add a, a couple percent, a couple percent the week after that. Eventually, if we stick with it long enough, we will actually get to the sweet spot, whatever that percentage might be for that particular person. And they might actually get stronger, but then we're going to keep pushing. We're going to keep adding weight each week because we think we know what progressive overload is. We now are putting the body into kind of survival mode. Like it knows it needs to do the thing. It's going to lift the weight. You're not going to fail in front of your peers or anything like that. Like there's things that are at play there that are going to drive you to complete it. And then you test that one rep max again, and it is higher because you're in this sort of survive state but you haven't actually gotten stronger because like you mentioned, if you come back the day after or the week after, or Hey, try testing the one rep max in a dead quiet gym with the lights off, you may not get anywhere close to that. So it's all this kind of make believe it's this make believe trajectory that we assume to be true because it looks nice on an Excel sheet. And I think one thing to not miss here, and this is like a little bit of a pivot on what we're talking about, but I think a lot of people, especially in like the evidence-based strength world, pull up a study and it compares two methods and one method on average does a little better. Boom, it is superior. But like all of the research is based on finding average responses to certain training stimuli rather than finding individual responses. And we did an episode a while back. Why am I blanking on the guys that we brought on? What's the name of their program? 
data driven strength. There yeah, we go. Data driven strength. Um, we brought them on and we had a big conversation about this because this is a lot of what they're doing is trying to predict individual responses to given stimuli rather than average responses. But if you look at any of these studies, you can like find the actual data they use. And in any given program style, intervention, stimulus, whatever, you're going to find a bunch of like responders, like right around the middle of the bell curve, you're going to find some super responders out at the end who would happen to be kind of perfect for, or they were primed to improve a lot or whatever it was. But you're also going to find definitely some non-responders, people who didn't get quite the benefit that everybody else did. And in a lot of cases, like a surprising number of cases, you will find negative responders. Mm -hmm. So on this program that works on average, there were a few people who got worse by doing it. And the I think this is like kind of core to why auto regulation and RPE and stuff is valuable is that it helps you in partnership with the athlete, or if you're doing it on your own, it helps you on your own explore what works for you and like track your responses to different things over time, rather than following an equation somebody said to follow, because there are athletes out there who respond really well, specifically to high intensity. And then there are athletes who don't and who respond better to volume rather than intensity. And like, you can't figure that out if you're following a prescribed at this percent, you should do this many sets and this many reps, you you have to allow for the subjective experience of the athlete to guide it a little bit. And I would, we don't have to get into this because it's a whole different thing, but I would encourage people, if you're curious about that type of stuff, mean responses and all that, look up N of one research, which is where you find the optimal dose in this case for the individual. And it's an interesting corner of the research space because like you mentioned, more often than not, these peer-reviewed studies, it's it's a certain sample size, you get this distribution, and then they report on the mean. And it's like, well, hey, what about like the 20% of people that like got killed by your squad program? Oh, no, no, no. Like ignore those guys. Look at the 20% that like did really well. Like that's basically how this whole industry is propped up. So anyway. I even I even went digging for some of that, not N of one research, but I went digging for some research on like which is superior auto regulation or a percentage-based program. And Eric Helms, you've probably heard his name if you listen to a lot of strength and conditioning podcasts and stuff, but he did actually do some research having like half of a group follow a percent one rep max program and half of a group follow a RPE based program. And yes, the RPE based program folks statistically did a little bit better, but I'm, I'm not even going to link the study in the show notes here because it's almost irrelevant because it's a grand total of 24 dudes training in like a pretty controlled environment and like if you look at the scatter plot, there's enough individual variation between it that for some people, the percent one rep max thing might work better. It's just on average, the RPE worked better for more people. And it, it comes back to the same place we were at before where there's a need to individualize and incorporate subjective metrics. Well, but even more so than that, you look at a study like that and it's, it is the question even about which one does better than the other. I think to me, it's more important that allowing for auto regulation and individuality perform just as well as percentages yeah. and the risk versus reward, which we may get into in a little bit, like it's way more low risk to auto-regulate something. So that's our rant on the percentage side of things. And we'll, we'll circle back around, I think, towards the end to kind of talk about some of the, the pros or some ways in which you could actually use percentages to your advantage. But we mentioned rate of perceived exertion, and I think I may have said reps in reserve at one point. So mm -hmm. just real briefly, real briefly comparing those two things. So Rate of perceived exertion, like I mentioned, zero to 10 is how you'll most often see it. More frequently, you may see like a five to 10 or a six to 10, especially when you get into resistance training. And simply the reason for that is because it's hard to differentiate a one versus a three. Um, and I think Eric, if not if not Eric Helms, certainly some folks in his circle kind of showed that your, your best bet is to stick to like a six to 10, maybe even a seven to 10 scale. And I think when I... When I program, I don't really go any lower than a six because, again, the further away you get from a, a true 10, like a true max subjectively, the the less accurate the scale gets. So I'll also jump in for a second to say that the, the fact that we use essentially five to 10 or six to 10 in the strength training space makes a lot more sense when you tie it back to the Borg scale um, and like where this all came from. Because on the Borg scale, the bottom end of it is a six and it's a six which loosely ties to a heart rate of 60, which means you are straight up at rest for mm -hmm. almost anybody. And there's not a lot you can do of any intensity in the resistance training space that's going to put you between 
like the level of intensity that would be a 60 heart rate and the level of intensity yeah. like, that would be a, like a 90 heart rate. Like, like what's an RPE you're not, too? You're not doing a lot of endurance training in that range anyway, right. other than like walking casually to your car or something. Um, so like really intensities start once you get halfway up the chart. Yeah. So it's just, it's a way of just accelerating your journey to the end goal, which is to quantify the intensity. So that's, that's rate of perceived exertion one to 10, which is fine in and of itself. Um, I will, however, say that there, you do run into some challenges with this and I can speak to it specifically from a military setting because you got to figure like for somebody who's just, this sounds really bad to say, but like somebody who's just like average run of the mill, whatever, like an RPE 10, a 10 out of 10 effort for them they're going to quantify that next to a lot of other experiences in their life. And a 10 out of 10 for them is going to be different than a 10 out of 10 for somebody who is just like a tier one smooth operator, been through selection, bad at, you know, whatever. So you do get into some subjectivity on top of the subjectivity, if that makes sense, which is where I would argue reps and reserve comes in. And I don't know if I remember who first introduced reps and reserve. Was it Mike? Do we know? I have no idea. Okay. I'm sure somebody out there knows and, and could point us in the right direction, but reps and reserve flips RPE on its head, literally flips it on its head in the sense that a 10 out of 10 effort, so a true maximal effort would be one that left you with zero reps in reserve, a rep in reserve being a rep that you've just kind of got left in the tank. So one that you don't do. And then a rep in reserve of one would correlate kind of with like an RPE of nine and two with eight, et cetera. So the nice thing about reps in reserve is it kind of equates across the board. If you walk into the gym, somebody else walks into the gym, we'll say like my mom walks into the gym and I say, okay, lift a weight for five reps that you feel like you could do for seven. Like if you really had to, you could do two more reps. That would be a two RIR R I R or a two rep in reserve weight. Does that, I mean, do we really need to dive deeper into that? Does that make sense? I think, I mean, I just listened I to Mike Shear talk about it last night, but it's, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's the idea of like not going always to failure and like estimating how many more you could have done when you stopped. That's it. And I, I mean, to me, these two things are, are virtually interchangeable so much so that I don't know how many people I'm coaching kind of one-on-one -on -one right now, but some of them will do RPE. Some of them, I will just use reps in reserve as the nomenclature, because it just happens to make more sense for them. So those two things are interchangeable. The The big key takeaway there is that it allows for the individuality. It allows for the subjectivity. It allows for the um, fluctuations that we talked about that percentages just don't. So I guess the, the next, well, I'll ask you why is subjectivity important and we'll talk about it. Let's talk about it from the military perspective, since that's kind of our audience here. I will say I did a, a little bit of quick Googling while you were talking to check on who introduced reps in reserve. And a lot of stuff does in fact, point back to Mike Tashir. So maybe that be. is, it might be, um, interestingly, it didn't really like enter the research until more recently. It's not something that's been researched a lot. Um, we're talking like within the last 10 years, but whatever. Well, and that's, that's the other thing too, with this is it seems to me, at least RPE reps, in, like, it feels contemporary and cutting edge and all that. And I don't really know if it is. It's just that you don't find as much research on it as you do with the traditional, oh, we yeah. did this 12 week Soviet block, whatever, with leg extensions and our population of 12 college aged men got stronger. It's like sick. That does nothing for me. And you asked me, like, why subjectivity or whatever? Why does it matter? And I think if we make this thing simple, which is like the idea in a one on one series, right? All it is, is that on days where you feel particularly good and you're ready to go for it, you should go for it. And on days where you kind of feel like crap, you should dial it back. That's it. It's not, it doesn't have to be super sciencey. It's not an excuse to go easy in the gym and expect to get better results or something like that. It's just a way of navigating the outside stressors you have put on you as you are approaching training. So you don't go like, you don't have the you don't have my Excel spreadsheet that told you what weights to do because that's what I used to do all the time <laughs> and feel bad because it feels heavy that day or you feel great and the weights feel light that day and you feel like you didn't train as hard as you could have. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of the whole thing. Well, I think there's two, there's two pieces of that because you, one, you have, you have the acknowledgement of the fact that what you just mentioned is true. It, 
like your, your ability to perform fluctuates daily. So we acknowledge that boom. I think anybody in this industry would agree with you. The second hurdle is okay. Given that that's true, do you have a system in place that accounts for that? And if you turn around and show me a 12 week spreadsheet that already predicts what my athlete's going to do eight Tuesdays from now, you don't have a system that accounts for that. You're just paying it lip service. So, you know, we could get in and maybe this is a future episode about like constraint constraints based programming and things like that. But there are ways that a cerebral, intelligent strength and conditioning professional can structure a program to allow for that fluctuation. So I kind of gave the, the one-on-one overview of what a percentage based program would look like. And I guess it, it would make sense to do the same thing with an auto-regulated program. And I'll, I'll just kind of explain this. I'll, I'll try and keep it as simple as I did with the percentage thing, but I will add that there are probably some nuances to it that are worth mentioning. Number one, I don't really think that you need to know your one rep max to run an auto-regulated training program. The reason for that is because with auto-regulation, with RPE, each session effectively becomes your benchmark. So you don't have to have some week one, boom, here's our max. And then we run this percentage ladder and then boom, here's our retest. With auto-regulation, every session becomes its own signal. So if Alex walks into the gym and I say, hey, I want you to do three sets of five at an RPE of eight or three sets of five at an RIR of two. He puts some weight on the bar. He he lifts it. That feels pretty easy. Add some weight. That feels pretty easy. That, you know, add some weight. It's getting a little bit harder. Next thing you know, he's at a weight that he feels like, you know, maybe I could have only done that for two more reps. And whatever the day is, let's say today he does that and it's 450 pounds. We've made you super strong in this episode, by the way. Well done. I love it. Um, let's say it's 450 pounds. Great. How I would program off of that, if three by five at RPE eight is my week one, day one squat program, week two, day one, it's exactly the same. It's three sets of five at RPE eight. And guess what? Week three, day one, it's exactly the same, which is why I get so frustrated when people try to overcomplicate auto-regulation. It's so much easier because you don't need to change anything. And to to throw back to the barbell medicine dudes, they have a whole article on this. Yeah. Um, I'll probably drop it in the show notes, but like all you got to do is during your warm-up sets, gauge mm-hmm. how hard they feel compared to previous times lifting the same yep. weight. Yep. And that just guides you to what your top sets should be. And they, they phrase this way more eloquently than I do in some of their episodes, the barbell medicine guys, but the reason why I don't change it every week. So like you might look at this and say, well, yeah, on week one, we would do three by five at an RPE of seven. And then week two, it would be an RPE of eight and week three, it would be an RPE of nine. That's not the athlete progressing. That's just you making it harder, Mm -hmm. which I think is is important because if you keep it, for example, at eight, which I would argue is kind of your standard maintenance dose. It's hard, but it's not too hard. It's sustainable. Again, you hit 450 pounds. We come back a week later. We, By virtue of using auto-regulation, we've already taken into account everything that we've just talked about. Your mood state, whether or not you went out, partied hard on the weekend, are you pumped to train, is the music, you know, whatever. So you come in, you knew on week one that, hey, my RPE8 for five reps on week one was 450 pounds. So in my head, as I'm warming up, my kind of goal for today would be to meet or exceed that number. 450 pounds. Let's just kind of put that as a target on the wall. I'm warming up. I'm feeling good. The music's pumping for you. What is it? Taylor Swift. Like Taylor Swift is blaring. I'm ready to roll. For me, it would be Celine Dion, full transparency. So you get to 450, you do it for, for a set of five and you're like, man, that felt, that was flying. I could have done three more reps. That, that felt easy. Okay, cool. Well, let's add a little bit more weight. Boom. You've, you've adapted. The bull feels lighter to Milo because Milo got stronger. We didn't just add weight to the bull and assume that Milo, i.e. Alex, could pick it up. Conversely, and this is where it becomes very important, if you partied hard that weekend, you listen to too much Taylor Swift, you come in, 450 is the goal on the wall. You get to like 425 and you're like, man, that I grinded that out. I don't think I could have done another rep. That's not an RPE of eight. That's like an RPE nine or 10. So you've, you've kind of exceeded, but we've allowed for that and we've accounted for it because truthfully, and this is where I think there's a ton of deviation between percentages and RPE. If you look at a percentage-based program and you mentioned the spreadsheets, 
usually those come with a pretty graph that shows you this line that's kind of trending up. And every once in a while it goes down for a deload and then it trends up again and it's very linear. And that's just not how human beings grow. What we really do is we go up and down and up and down and up and down. But as long as we're trending in the right direction, the program is working. So week one, you were 450. Week two, you felt like shit, you were 425. Week three, you felt great, you were 455. Week four, you were 465. Week five, you were 450 because you felt like ass again. But we're moving in the right direction. And so I think to kind of put a bow on this before I turn it back to you, what auto-regulation and using an RPE-based program work requires of the coach is that they are involved in the process, which I think for some coaches is unsettling because we don't want to be involved because to be involved means we have to work. And if we work, we might start breathing hard because we don't do cardio. So you have to be involved. You have to understand what's happening with the athlete and monitor the signal that they're giving you, i.e. what their rate of perceived exertion is at these different weights. You can't just hand them 12 weeks and then disappear. So that's like my intentionally cynical take on all of that. Did we miss anything? I don't think we missed anything. I do want to add like a tiny note that I used to think about a lot, like early in when I was diving into all the coaching stuff. And that's that RPE can also be used retrospectively to track your progress in a way other than weight. Mm -hmm. So hypothetically, we'll use my same numbers from before. I do my workout. 450. My, my top set is <laughs> at 450. And I come back a few weeks later. I've been doing some different stuff, trying new things in my training. Not sure. So I just like, I'm going to do the exact same workout. I'm going to hit the same numbers. But this time, it feels a little easier. That is also progress. Like that is the same dose still working. So I could keep using, I could keep using the same weight. And if it continues to feel easier, that is just as much progress as if I was putting more weight on the bar, but keeping it the same level of difficulty yes. that is allowed. Which if this is not necessarily a plug for long and strong, but I guess it kind of will be with long and strong. I use what I call a double progression method, which you can Google that it's, it's a thing, but effectively to what you're speaking or what you're talking about you'll see rep ranges alongside RPE, which effectively means you can use the same weight for a number of weeks. And as the number of reps you can complete with that weight goes up at the mm -hmm. same RPE. So if 450 for five is an RPE of eight for you this week, you come back the next week. Now 450 for six is an RPE of eight. You have gotten stronger. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we're just going to keep adding weight. It means that we've allowed for that adaptation to occur. And once that signals to me as the coach, hey, he has exceeded my stimulus, which was a set of five. He's exceeded that. Now I can now I can push things. Now we can increase the RPE. We can decrease the reps because that's the other thing. If RPE stays fixed at eight and we decrease the reps, theoretically, the weight that you would be lifting would go up. It's the same level of effort for fewer reps. You're lifting more weight. Anything else on that? What do you think? I think that's it. That's all I got. Okay. So, um, to sort of circle back around and I guess work ourselves towards a close here, one versus the other better or worse pros and cons. Um, just real briefly, I'll mention something that I took from Miladin Jovanovic, I believe, uh, if you guys know complimentary training.net, you may know their, their job board. It's a prolific job board. Um, but he talks about pushing the floor or sorry, pulling the floor versus pushing the ceiling. And basically what that means, the other phrasing that he uses is like explore versus exploit. Um, you can think of it as like maintaining versus peaking or pushing. There's a couple of different ways to conceptualize it, but pushing the, pushing the ceiling means that we are like trying to force adaptation on the athlete. So this would fly in the face of all the things we just talked about in terms of how we actually get stronger. But to be, to be true, there is a time and a place for that. If you have a performance, if you have a, a race, a game, a PT test, whatever, where you have to hit a certain thing, a number, a time, a, a weight, then sometimes it we need to push. We need to get you into that survival state that we talked about at the top. I wouldn't say that's forcing adaptation. I would just say that's testing your limits sometimes. That's, that's a totally reasonable sure. thing to do is just kind of push the limits a little bit. Sure. No, that's, and that's fair. But I guess what I'm getting at that is like with, with the, with the pulling the floor approach or the explore approach or the maintenance approach, we're just, we're kind of, we're pushing, what is it? A rising tide lifts all boats. Is that the phrase to say? Mm -hmm. 
So we don't need to push anything at the expense of anything else. We don't need to like overcompensate and drive you towards a one rep max at the expense of every other variable variable in your training. So in that type of environment, rate of perceived exertion, reps in reserve, auto regulation, to me, like there's no other way to do it. That is the way. That is the best way to do it. You will not ever convince me that percentages are a more uh, accurate or legitimate way of keeping an athlete where they should be more often than not, which is just kind of progressively getting a little bit better each time. Um, so our percentage is better for that kind of push the ceiling, exploit, work towards a peak. Are they better? Maybe. Um, it, it might, the athlete might like seeing a number on the wall. They might like driving towards a percentage. They might like the idea of working towards a run a one rep max and that's okay. But I'll caveat that by saying that there are ways to do that with auto regulation and with RPE. We don't need to get into all the weeds now, but you can peak an athlete using auto regulation. Mike Tashira talks about it all the time. You have anything on that? My only thought there is that all it is, is like, other than some like nerdy power lifters on Instagram, I don't think anybody gets stoked about like, that's my RPE seven PR. <laughs> like that's the most I've ever done at RPE seven. Yeah, it doesn't smile like RPE doesn't 8 PR. It doesn't, it doesn't get you stoked. Like there's no record boards in the gyms saying that like, this is their max at a certain RPE. Like when it, when it comes to pushing the limits, it kind of has to be an objective number. Right. And that's why, that's why you tend to move in that direction when you are trying to test what you are capable of. I think, I think this is where we fall into that trap of like, if some is good, more is better. And us saying that pushing the limits and driving a percentage is there's a time and place for it does not mean that that time is always and that place yeah. is everywhere. It just means yeah. like, and talking about Instagram again, sort of shout out to the barbell medicine guys and, and Mike Tashir as well. You'll see them post videos of lifting where they're like, Oh, this was an RPE nine last time. And now it's like an RPE eight. So like you, you can't do it. It's just, it's a little bit different. So one thing I will touch on briefly is that there are ways to combine these two things. Uh, the data-driven strength guys have talked about it. I've programmed like this before in the past. It's a tool that you could use. Um, and the way that this would work is it it kind of revolves around this idea of an estimated one rep max or an E1RM. Again, something you can Google, something you can look up. There's even calculators for it. But the way that this would work is Alex comes into the gym and I, I have him work towards a daily max. I say, okay, we're going to work to a set of two at an RPE of nine. So for him, that's like a really heavy double. That's like a good test of, of his strength for the day. And then once we have that number, we can either use that weight or we can run one of these E1RM calculators and say, okay, if if two at RP if if two reps at RPE eight for Alex today was a was 400 pounds, what is his estimated one at max? And I'm making this up. I don't have the calculator in front of me, but let's say that it spits back 450 pounds then we might do drop sets. So, Hey, we're going to do three sets of five at 85% of your one of your estimated one rep max. So you can see that we have the objectivity of percentages and I can, I can drive intensity there by skewing that percentage higher. We can go 90% or I can go lower. Let's go 75%. So we use the objectivity of percentages, but it's based off of a subjective estimated one rep max that by default or by definition allows for the subjective fluctuation in his ability to perform. And I will tell folks, this is getting a little bit into the weeds, but this idea, which Mike Tashir again, was kind of the guy that introduced this to me. This comes from a, a coach, Anatoly Bondarchuk, who I believe we've mentioned a number of times on this podcast before, but he was a throws, a, a Russian throwing coach, hammer toss specifically. And what he would do is he would have his athletes, they would come in and they would do, they would throw the hammer every day. Then they would look at the max distance and he would track that distance over time. And he would literally have his athletes do the exact same. So Alex would be my athlete. He does the exact same workout every single day. I don't change anything about that workout. And we track that hammer throw distance. And that hammer throw distance increases, 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 increases. Then it starts to plateau. Then it starts to go down. Okay, cool. That signals to me that he has adapted to this stimulus. Then I change the workout. We track the hammer throws again, because in this case, hammer throwing is as sports specific as we can get for these hammer throwers. Rinse and repeat. You kind of see how that goes. How would that work in weightlifting? What's kind of the hammer throw equivalent of, of lifting a weight? It would be that daily 
estimated one rep max or estimated two rep max. So talking about signaling within a program, you as the coach would just track those estimated one rep maxes. So if, if you came in, you did the thing, we worked to a double at eight, your estimated one rep max is 450. We keep you on that same progression, that same stimulus for as long as that estimated one rep max continues to kind of trend up. That's just, that's a way of combining those two things. If you want to see that done to like its absolute peak, again, look at Mike Tashir's work because he will get it down to the point where he can look at each one of his athletes and say, okay, I know for Steve over there, his adaptation peaks after six exposures. For Alex, his adaptation peaks after four exposures. For Diana, her adaptation peaks after 12 exposures. Like you can really, really dial it in. I'm not saying people need to do that, but just know that it it can be done. Um, so that to me would be a way of combining in a sense percentages and auto regulation. I dig it. Um, as Drew continues to ramble despite knowing <laughs> I told him I had to leave by now. Oh yeah, you're hot, you're hot yoga class. I gotta get to yoga, man. But I will uh I'll try and put a bow on this. And as Drew was talking earlier, it reminded me of a quote from one of our early podcasts. Um, this one was with Vince Pikowski, uh, one of the a member of the winning best ranger team in 2021. Um the goal is not to come in and swing the hammer hard every day. The goal is to be ready to swing the hammer hard when that time comes. Um, he went on to talk about how the only way you do that is consistency. Mm -hmm. I think RPE is a pretty good tool for that in terms of it allows you to continue to train consistently. It allows you to account for adaptation that is occurring because we know it's always occurring without necessarily doing what we talked about before, which is testing the limits all the time. Like a lot of programs will force people to be constantly bumping up against testing the limits and that can get frustrating and feel like a plateau. Um, not a mistake that there's lots of auto regulation in the way Vince trains. You can hear all about it in that episode, but yeah, this is, this is a tool to make sure we are keeping the stimulus in a range where it is still going to produce adaptation, accounting for all the stressors of life, whether you're military or not military that are going to get in the way of having it be a perfect training day every day. Boom. And there's probably episodes that will spin off of this episode. This is one where I would send people to the show notes. If you do want to hear more, uh, cause like you said, you, you have a hot yoga class to get into and I could talk about this for hours. So hopefully you guys enjoyed, uh, this was our one on one series, uh, talking about RPE versus percentages. Let us know what to cover in the next one. Boom. Bye. Hey, Alex, let's cover our ass real quick. Oh, great idea, Drew. All right, guys. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Before you go, please rate and review the pod on the listening platform of your choice. You can also visit us on our website at www.mopsinmos.com. That's mops, the letter N, mos.com. You can check out the library of podcast episodes, our latest blog entries, any helpful resources, and also sign up for our newsletter. Drew nailed it. Just to underline a couple of things, the podcast entries have in-depth show notes on the website. So if you missed anything or you want to read any of the research we talk about, it is all there. You can, at the bottom of the website, sign up with your email and we receive future updates from us. The blog posts go a little bit more in depth in kind of written form on a couple of topics we get questions about all the time. But most importantly, I just want to ask all you guys, our best way the word gets out is absolutely word of mouth. So tell your friends, tell the people you work with, anybody you think would find it useful. Thanks for spreading the word. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot us an email at either Drew or Alex at mopsandmos.com. Or there's a contact form on the website.